out on drive and I want to dedicate this morning to something that's not as well known as the big animals and that is butterflies. Butterfly watching and identifying is also a very exciting activity and there are many parallels and similarities between butterfly watching and identification and bird watching and pretty much the same principles that we applied and you may recall from our episode that we dedicated to bird watching will be similar to that applied to when we're watching butterflies or trying to ID them. So first and foremost I think there's a couple of things that you need, uh, essential equipment that you need. Um, butterfly field guide, very important to have. It's one of the particular area that you're in. A very good pair of binoculars is always very handy. Butterflies just like birds are often further away and they don't sit still or they're flitting around so a good pair of binoculars is always very handy. And then last but not least, uh, this is a nice piece of kit to have if you partaking in butterfly identification, is a butterfly capture net. And there's, uh, this is what that looks like pretty much. Try and find one that's got a relatively long handle that can either extend or is permanently set like that because you often need to reach a little bit further away to try and capture a butterfly and if you've got a short handle that becomes a little bit more difficult. So once you've got all the, the kit that you need or the equipment that you need for butterfly collection or identification, um, try and apply the same principles and you'd remember from the bird watching video I said that you have to look at the general information about the shape and size of the butterfly. Alright, so that's very similar. Um, there are approximately 666 butterflies in Southern Africa, so there's more than 600 species just in Southern Africa and they're divided into five families. Now those families are key to identifying butterflies, they're very important and again just like with bird watching try to recognize the field characteristics of the different families which will then enable you to go back into the book and try and locate the particular butterfly that you're looking at. We also have to cover several different uh, habitats or ecosystems for that matter. Uh, so when looking to try and identify butterflies you need to cover as much ground as possible, go through different vegetation types because different types of butterflies or different species of butterfly prefer different habitats as well, just like birds. So travel as much as you can, cover as much ground, learn the five families and their field characteristics, have the equipment necessary and then all of that will really aid you in starting the exciting, and it's very exciting because the butterflies are very beautiful, many many are very colourful also one of the features that help us recognize them. So color is important, um, habits, uh, what they're doing at the time, where they are and how they behave and then identifying the families. Those are the five things that I would focus on to try and help you when you embark on your new adventure of identifying butterflies. So very similar to what we did in the birding video, I'm going to go out and try and see if I can find the odd butterfly here and there and we can maybe try and catch one and look at it in detail, close up and let it set it free again after that. Um, so I don't want this episode really to go about trying to find as many butterflies as possible or what they are, but really about how I apply the methods or the principles to identify butterflies. So let's get out there and see what's waiting for us. So this particular butterfly I've caught here belongs to a family called Acreus. Now the Acreus are interesting 
group of butterflies in the sense that they have a defense mechanism which implements the use of toxins to deter would-be predators. In their particular case, they have a hydrogen cyanide, so a cyanide in liquid form, which in the adult phase and sometimes in the caterpillar phase, they obtain from the types of plants that they feed on. So they actually get this poison from the plant and then they carry it across into the adult stage. Have an interesting color configuration which consists mostly of orange, black, whites and yellows um, and the combination thereof. This butterfly, we're coming to the end of the summer season, it's lost a little bit of its color. So as butterflies get older towards the end of the season, and some of them only live one season, some live a number of days only, some live one season, some can live one or two years. Uh, they start losing their color when they start reaching the end of, of their life expectancy or lifespan. But you'd notice the, the little dots on this butterfly, the black dots, and then the yellow-orange smudged color there. And we refer to that as aposmatic coloration, which means warning colors or advertised warning colors. And this butterfly then warns a would-be predator that because of its bright colors, it has a toxin and it is unpalatable. And that's how they defend themselves against being taken by something like a bird for instance. So the interesting thing about uh, butterflies that use aposmatic coloration and that implement toxins as a defense strategy is that they don't fly very high and they have a very lazy flight pattern. Low to the ground, very slow and they will go and perch on a little shrub or a little tree or bush and they actually open their wings and display their warning colors very purposefully because they want to avoid being taken accidentally because then their chemical defense strategy is not going to be that effective. So yes, very interesting group, the Acreas, one of the five families of butterflies in Southern Africa. And yes, we're going to let it go. It will go shortly, just sitting on my finger there. And there it lies. So I managed to catch this uh, beautiful broad bordered grass yellow and you'd see or you'd notice when it opens the wings you'd see it's predominantly yellow in color with a broad dark brown border around the edges and so the name is very descriptive of what the butterfly actually looks like. So that's a uh, Nice species and we're going to let it go, have a last look at it and then I'll just let it go. driving around looking for butterflies, as I mentioned, covering different habitats. Once you get into butterfly identification and you start knowing a couple of species and families, you also be able to then implement the mechanism whereby you start looking for butterflies by looking at their food plants. 
So various butterfly species and their caterpillars are very specific in terms of the food plants that they utilize to feed on. And once you know that, you have that knowledge, it's then also a little bit easier to drive around and look for specific food plants in areas which may then alert you of the presence of that particular butterfly in, in that surrounding area. I was very fortunate in managing to catch this beautiful blue pansy. It belongs to the family Nymphalidae or Nymphalids. And there's several different pansy species. There's a yellow pansy and a black pansy. They all look very similar, but what's very prevalent in this particular one are those beautiful blue, almost purple, dots on the insides of the wings. So just again with reference to what I've been speaking about, the blue pansy that we just caught. So I understand and I know that that particular species belongs to the family Nymphalidae, or Nymphalids, as I said. And if you understand what the characteristics of the Nymphalidae family are, then you can just go to the book to the Nymphalidae section and then look for the particular species. So we're looking at a steenbok, a little male with the horns. The female in this species don't have any horns. We're quite lucky to find them. They can sometimes conceal themselves very well, which is one of the mechanisms they use to escape their predators. But they're certainly not an uncommon antelope. There's a lot of them around. Male and female steenbok form monogamous breeding pairs and they're highly territorial within their territory ranges. They certainly defend those territories quite aggressively against other steenbok. extending the butterfly trip a little bit. Uh, we ran out of time the other morning, we didn't find enough butterfly species so uh, we decided to set out again this morning and see if we can uh, find an additional couple of butterflies. So while we're out, uh, just started, we came across this, uh, it's a really nice example. You can see here, you notice quite a lot of activity, a lot of movement in the soil here coupled with uh, some hyena tracks. This is just an area where hyena was laying up last night or early this morning. So we're looking at a beautiful specimen, a butterfly called the spotted joker, which belongs to the family Nymphalidae. This is one of the really breathtaking, as far as the coloration goes, uh, species that you may encounter in the bush quite commonly they're not uh, they're not uncommon and it's definitely one of the nicest butterflies to see when you're walking in the bush the second one has just joined that one sitting on the tree there how beautiful is that What a beautiful sighting of a kudu, nice kudu bull. You can see the ox pecker on its back. If you listen carefully, you can hear the ox pecker chirping quite dramatically. And that's very typical of ox peckers. They alert sometimes the mammals that they perch on of approaching danger by doing that, which is their alarm call. The benefit of that for us though is when we're walking in the bush and we hear that it often alerts us as well that we are more cautious because there may be a buffalo or a rhino ahead.
So I was lucky, just managed to catch that uh, painted lady. It's probably one of the most beautiful butterflies. Also the colors are a little bit dim there, getting towards the end of the season. So she's not as bright and colorful as they, they are in the beginning of summer. But nonetheless, painted lady, very, very nice butterfly to catch. So I've got a very pretty little butterfly that I've caught here. And you'd see that it's predominantly white in color. There's little orange tips that it have there that's quite uh, distinctive. But the white is what I'd like to talk about and refer to. And that is, again, putting it into a particular family. So, butterflies that are predominantly white are referred to as whites. And they belong to the family called Pyridae or Pyrids. And there again, understanding the family and then where to look for that particular species in the family in the book is important in this case. Watching this elephant drinking water, you can see the bottom part of this front there, how dark it is. He's dipping it into the water. Trunk is an incredible mechanism. It has several thousands of muscles in it. And essentially it really is the with tongue in cheek, it's the the knife and fork of the elephant is what they utilize to select, pick and place the food in their mouth with as this guy is walking away had enough to drink so very lucky to catch this uh, African monarch you can see their beautiful display on the inside of the wings and if you recall when I spoke about the acria I spoke about the apismatic coloration so the oranges the whites the blacks and the combination thereof as a warning color which refers to the fact that this is a non-palatable or toxic species so like the acria and oh, I said that the acria is have a hydrogen cyanide as a defense strategy or mechanism the the Danis family or the monarchs have a cardioglycoside which is a type of a heart toxin they also obtain this from food plants that they feed on in both the adult and the caterpillar phase or stage there's another mechanism that they utilize when trying to mate with a female and they use the same alkaloids that they obtain from plants you'd notice there are these two black dots on the back there on either side of the hind wing there's one there and one there if you feel them they're actually little raised bumps and those are those are glands or pockets they call them or they refer to them as androconia and they actually hold within those pockets some of these alkaloids in a pheromone or powder form in which the male then during the process of courtship when he flits and hovers above the female he dusts some of this pheromone over her which then in turn will stimulate her into mating with him so the monarch, belonging to the family of Danidae or Danis, you see the beautiful apismatic coloration there. And yes, we're going to just let him go. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed the, the butterfly drive. Um, most certainly it's a very exciting and interesting part of the ecology to get involved in. And uh, just the... The multi-colored families of butterflies are very distinct in the field and they, it's very inspirational to see all these beautiful butterflies flying around and then 
with not knowing too much about them. So make a point of getting your nose in the books, learning the families, what their characteristics are, and then get out there and find yourself some butterflies.